Welcome to another episode of At Home Around the World, where we're talking to uh, people uh, in all jurisdictions uh, that we have worked with over the years in order to uh, examine a little bit of, of, of the impact that COVID has had on them and their workplace, and also to see how they see things going forwards when hopefully we are out of the present difficulties. Now, I'm delighted to be joined today by Martin Wilbers. Martin is the Deputy Legal Counsel at CERN. Now, everybody has um, heard of CERN now, uh, but when Martin and I started working together almost 30 years ago, it was less well known to the general public. Uh, the combination uh, of Dan Brown, Angels and Demons, and more recently, and much more importantly, the discovery of the Higgs boson particle has really brought CERN to the public aware, or, or has increased CERN's um, uh, awareness to the public at large. Now, Martin has been at CERN as a lawyer as long as I've known him, uh, but I know he did things before that. So perhaps, Martin, we could just kick off by uh, giving a little bit of background um, uh, of your career, both before and whilst you've been at CERN. Peter, thank you very much for having invited me. That's, a, that's a, an honor and a privilege. Um, let me first mention that uh, I have this uh, background here, which Peter, no doubt, you recognize because you've been involved in some of the legal aspects of, the, uh, of their construction and operation. These are a few of the 1232 dipole magnets that together make the uh, LHC work. And, uh, and I thought to put this one uh, behind me instead of in um, our kitchen or my study or something like that, because in fact, uh, I'm, the work at home for me is now about 50%, and I'm very happy to say that I'm already for the other 50% going back to CERN to my workplace. And even if the tunnel is not my workplace, I thought that that symbolizes this um, uh, happy move of going back to some degree of normalcy. Um, Peter, I, um, before, I joined, uh, before I joined CERN, um, uh, my law studies were first in uh, Indiana, in the United States, uh, pre-law studies, as they call it there. That was all the way back in 1976. Then I did my full, let's say, law school uh, in Leiden, in Leiden University in the Netherlands. Um, that was essentially in private and corporate law, before moving to Vienna um, for um, further studies, in fact, in international institutional law mostly, which, as you know, is the... Uh, the law of international organizations and supranational organizations. Um, I was a young idealist, of course, when I came out of university. I still have to, stu am to some extent, I think. And my heart was very much in the world of public international law, and which meant that I, I decided to try to work in that environment. And I joined UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees here in Geneva. Um, they then, after an initial period here, sent me, to, sent me off to their branch office in Nairobi, in Kenya, in East Africa, um, where I would be the junior legal officer. This was nothing less than a revelation for a youngster, I have to say, uh, perhaps for anyone. Um, interviews with asylum seekers in our camps, prison visits, uh, court visits, interactions with the Kenyan authorities, who were extremely hospitable and generous, by the way, to the refugees community. Uh, dealing with ICRC, etc., etc., and uh, I hope you don't mind, Peter. I just use this this uh, this uh, modest occasion just to say how impressive an organization UNHCR is. Um, the work that these people do is is often extremely challenging, and and uh, not a lot of people know that, perhaps, but it, it made a great impression on me. But then I felt that it was uh, time to do something with my private law. So, in fact, after my first stint there, I uh, joined, um, went completely in the opposite direction in many ways, uh, in the sense of legal domains, but also physically. I headed up north and, and joined KLM's legal department, uh, where I worked until 93 when I left as their uh, deputy. Um, it was a very interesting time. It was the time that uh, airlines started to merge and that there were takeovers, where KLM was actually the first one, I think, to do that on a fairly massive scale to get a foothold in the United States where Northwest Airlines was brought up at the time. Um, on one of my KLM trips, in fact, I went to Geneva to work at IATA for a few days meeting, and I uh, met the legal counsel by chance of, uh, of CERN, Jean-Marie Dufour, and, and, uh, and a few years later, uh, I received a letter in the mailbox to say, you know, why don't you come over because we have a vacancy. It was not so easy, that decision, because the airline was a fairly sexy environment with a lot of interesting travel, uh, mostly on KLM. 
Um, and, uh, and, and CERN in, in, in my option was, from my perspective, was more um, a slightly nerdy environment with a lot of facilities 100 meters below ground. But in the end, I decided to do it. And that was about 28 years ago, and I've uh, never regretted that. And the, the spirit of this lab is pretty, uh, pretty inspiring. Right? So, yeah. Yeah, well, you obviously found your place. Um, and uh, I think, by the way, the background looks fantastic. Um, it, it is a part of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider Tunnel, as you say. And um, it's not part uh, of the bit of CERN that the general public gets to see, though, is it? It's a privilege to be there. This happens, of course, as well when there is a shutdown and then it's times that people can go in the tunnel. I have to say for myself, this is just the accelerator, but when you look at the detectors, these enormous uh, particle detectors at the regular points of the, uh, of the accelerator, uh, that is truly humbling because this is small in size. The detectors are, are like an apartment building uh, underground, full of stuff that you've seen it as well with electronics, etc. And even for me, after all these years, it's a, it's a, I would say it's a humbling and inspiring um, visit always to go underground and a testimony to the ingenuity of mankind if they can work together. Absolutely. No, I've always found the same when I've been involved with, with anything to do with CERN. It is, it's quite a humbling experience. And, and the particle accelerator is, I think, rightly described as the, the biggest and most complex machine in the world. Um, so uh, it, it's um, it, it's quite an amazing piece of kit. Now you're uh, the, the, you're located um, at CERN, um, uh, which people think of as Geneva, but actually CERN is on the border um, of France and Switzerland, isn't it? Do, do yes. you want to explain a little bit about um, how CERN operates as an organisation um, from a legal yeah. perspective first, uh, and then perhaps a little bit about what actually happens at CERN from the perspective of the users, the physicists. Yeah, if, uh, Peter, if you don't mind, I'll turn it around. I'll say a little bit about what CERN does. Uh, I just want to pick up uh, on what you just said about how CERN is often described as such a you know, massive uh, technological marvel. Um, I remember when we had the, uh, and I think you've met at the time, the, uh, the LHC project leader, Lynn Evans. And I once asked Lynn, um, with what kind of scientific endeavor or technological endeavor can the construction of the LHC be compared? And I remember that he said, you're talking about uh, constructing, uh, designing, constructing, and launching two space shuttles at the same time, is what he, how he described it at the time. Amazing. There's other people, and this is a bit more ancient than demons like, probably, that describe this as underground cathedrals. There's a certain religious aspect to some people, I think, about all of this. Now, yes, uh, why, first a little bit about what CERN does. And I think I'm borrowing a bit from my friends in, uh, my colleagues in CERN Outreach, very capable colleagues. And, um, and they always begin by talking about the fact that curiosity obviously is as old as humankind. And, and, uh, and that is really, I think, in very simple terms, um, CERN's raison d'être. Uh, when the lab was founded in the mid 50s, uh, the structure of matter, I think, was an entire mystery. Uh, today, we know that visible matter in the universe is composed of, in fact, a remarkably small number of particles whose behavior is governed by a number of distinct forces. And CERN has played a vital role, I think, in, the, in reaching this understanding. But now we know that uh, ordinary visible matter makes up only, I think, about 5%, I understand, of the universe. And we only know about the rest because we get clues, because the effect of the rest, in fact, on what is the visible matter, on the 5%. Uh, but we don't know yet what that is, that 95%. And so finding out uh, is a question for the future, and, and that's where CERN is positioned in that. Um, maybe to add, um, there's more than the quest for knowledge of the structure of matter at CERN, um, more than just, well, I'll say just, more than seeking to answer questions about the universe. Um, CERN also plays a vital role, I think, in the development of technologies, future technologies, and there's a permanent knowledge transfer activity between CERN and industry, our partners. Um, and it's simply because particle physics demands truly the ultimate in performance, whether you're talking about material science, computing, and anything in between. So I, I guess most people know the example that I'll give now, and that people always start with, it's a bit boring, but that's the World Wide Web, which originally, and I think not a lot of people know that, was invented to allow uh, an ever-increasing number of um, scientists to share information between them. Uh, I think, to some extent, also revolutionary is the computing grid, uh, distributed computing, uh, which harnesses uh, the power of computers around the world. And that has been specifically developed to be able to process the data that our experiments uh, generate. And then the final thing I should mention, and this is also interesting, I find, and it's quite, um, quite a more recent development, I think, 
is that CERN is also fairly active in supporting medical applications work. Um, that has been particularly relevant. I'll come to that in the context of, of COVID as well. But you know, many modern medical techniques depend on acceleration and detection of particles. So uh, PET scanners, uh, Hadron therapy for cancer, etc., is something where a lot of knowledge and a lot of technology comes out of CERN. Um, now a little bit from the, the, the legal side, because I mean, physics first and then legal after that. Absolutely, you have to get it in the right order. <laughs> um, I, I think you can say that these days, the, the creation of a truly international organization as an intergovernmental organization, let alone a supranational organization, is a pretty rare phenomenon. Uh, but in the days that CERN was uh, created, um, it, it was seen as the, the right instrument uh, to bring humanity together. And so CERN's own creation as a European organization at the time uh, responded, I think, to a need for recreation, reconciliation between former belligerents, on the one hand, and it also answered um, a need to keep scientists in Europe, in Europe, avoid the brain drain, to the US in particular, and also make sure that, in fact, these physicists would have employment and, and the purposes that were peaceful uh, instead of anything that's related to military. And so, um, so CERN would therefore, you know, Europe would therefore have its own scientific facilities on a, on a scale that would be, would simply not be possible at a regional or even a national level, right? Um, the, um, the actual legal structure, um, there's a founding convention of CERN. CERN was founded, to the, which was signed in 1953. The organization, I think, came into force in 1954. Um, and it says that the organization provides for collaboration among uh, European states in nuclear research, the term nuclear at the time, of a pure and fundamental character. So here's a few important words. Particle physics, that term basically did not exist. The nucleus was the limit, I think, of our understanding of matter at the small distance scales, and hence the name of the lab. Um, not surprisingly, the convention states that the organization shall have no concern, it says, with work for military purposes, I believe is the literal quote. Europe was, of course, very keen to leave that behind. Um, supreme the supreme uh, body of our organization is the council, which is composed of uh, representatives of member state. There's always a scientific delegate, and then there's, a, let's say, a financial administrative kind of um, uh, delegate. The, um, the legal work um, spreads across, uh, roughly across two very broad domains. Uh, so on the one hand, we have, um, we have, institutional, inter uh, we have institutional law, inter international law in a wider sense, and we have private law matters on the other hand. And so we have two groups in the legal service that cover that. And, um, and I would say for a lawyer with some uh, curiosity uh, in, the, in, his, in his field, it's, it's actually a dream environment to operate in because the two mix all the time. This particular international status of CERN with its privileged immunities and other facilities um, is attached to almost every issue, any legal issue that plays. So we, we work together a lot on that. So in the domain of inter international law, interpretation of the convention, governance issues, preparation of council meetings, uh, privileges, immunities, obviously. Uh, we, do, we have safety and environment issues. CERN has its own safety and environment rules. Um, we also have in that the protection of our name and logo, which is by treaty, and, um, and staff rules and regulations, uh, which we also put in the, not in the private law box, but in the institutional law box. Accession of new member states is another example. And then in the domain of private law, I think the first one to mention perhaps would be intellectual property, which comes uh, across in all sorts of forms, copyrights and publications, IP mechanisms for um, our scientific collaborations, uh, use of licensing of computing uh, infrastructure, procurement, and then move away from IP, sorry, procurement contracts. Uh, CERN spends about half of its annual budget. So I think an amount to the tune of about 500 million is spent on procurement. And these are uh, quite often state-of-the-art type of contracts. That is, the contract is not necessarily state-of-the-art. The subject matter, the R&D, is in any event. And Peter, when you get involved, of course, the contract is state-of-the-art as well. Uh, commercial litigation, we have on my team in the, in the group, scientific agreements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, maybe one more comment about another aspect that I think is quite fascinating from the legal perspective, which is that, as you know, Peter, the border runs straight through the site. So the CERN side, we can say that there's a single site, but in reality, the CERN site is one site in France and one site in Switzerland. Originally only in Switzerland, then the precursor to the LHC accelerator was constructed, LEP, and went into French territory. So there we created a, a second site, which was in France. 
This provokes all sorts of issues, obviously. And, and one of them is what do you do with all these contractors that we have on the site? Um, let's say that the people are laying cables uh, in the morning in France, but in the afternoon the team has to move and do the prolongation of that in Switzerland. Um, what are the working hours? Will they change? Um, will the salary levels, the social insurance obligations change, et cetera, et cetera? There's a lot of questions that are similar to that. This particular question was solved in the end of the day uh, and put in a, an agreement, a treaty, you can say, between Switzerland and France, where in fact they came up, uh, working with us, came up with the, uh, the solution that, in fact, whenever there's a contract that CERN will put out to tender, we see what is, we try to decide what is the preponderant part, so to speak, where, what is the preponderant part of the, the work. So is most of the work done in France? Is most of the work done in Switzerland? That's the question. And we express that in FTEs, manpower. And then, and then it is agreed that the labor laws of that country, in fact, will apply even if the contractor crosses, as I say, you know, the border in the afternoon. Um, this was a major milestone because you can imagine that this was a, a, a true challenge. So a single applicable labor law. Yeah. So those are some of the legal. It, it's, it, it's always fascinated me, uh, certain status as an international organization in, in the way that it's almost operates uh, at least to the layman as a mini state uh, because of the things that you explained. You have your own rules and uh, you have control certainly over your site that, that straddles the border um, yes. and lots of uh, immunities and privileges and so on. So uh, is, is that something that... Um, is beneficial to work in generally. Uh, obviously, it's very interesting as a lawyer for all of the reasons that you, you've explained, but is, is that something that uh, uh, makes a, an attractive place for people to come and work, um, whether they're based in France or in Switzerland, or, or does it make life more difficult? I think it's a challenge, but, but um, overall, I think... Um, I think what is relevant, what is important also is that we have support both in France and Switzerland, obviously, in all of this. We don't rely on a single host state, and I think that it is good that we have support from both sides, which is very constructive. The, and that is expressed, for instance, in what you mentioned, these privileged immunities that are granted to CERN. Um, and um, I think for those who are familiar with that, we don't have to remind them of that, but I should say a few of the key ones are really um, perhaps the key um, uh, privilege, in fact, that's been granted to CERN is not in the fiscal domain. The one in the fiscal domain is simply there that, as you know, one or more states do not take advantage in a sense or have a particular advantage on the basis, you know, in, in respect of a budget that is funded by a multitude of states. And so yeah. that, that should, that's part of the background there. But I think one to mention that is extremely important is the free movement of people. And so the, the, the lack of hindrance, the lack of issues with immigration facilities is essential for CERN. Uh, when we go a little bit further in our dialogue, Peter, I will mention some of the numbers of the number of people that are on the site and where they're all coming from. And, um, and, and so the, the, the privileged communities granted with our, in respect of our particular status are essential for CERN. And, um, and, and this freedom of movement is... Um, how shall I say it? I mean, it's symbolic, I think, for the energy of the organization. I don't think that CERN could operate uh, without it, actually. I think it would be a great, great, great struggle. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see where it's going. I mean, one of the interesting things I, I thought as well, uh, which again is reflective of, of your status when we were working together on, uh, on the Large Hadron Collider, was the fact that you're not subject to EU public procurement requirements. That's right. And, and that, that, again, you, you have a different regime that applies to how you go about obtaining your goods and services. That's right. Of course, the challenge is, and, and in fact, let, let me say, it's not something that we asked for. It is there also because precisely the exemption is also foreseen in the public procurement directive. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, but yes, that has been helpful because it makes it easier for CERN to create. Um, it's not just about making sure that we buy, um, that we get the right uh, services and goods on, onto the site. Um, but it's also important that CERN um, should, tr we, we should also try to have a return for our member states um, who put in significant funding, obviously, to make this organization turn. And, and so we have a combination of criteria that should lead to getting the quality product out of the, contra out of the tendering process, uh, combined with, uh, with a couple of mechanisms that try as well to take into account the need to try to spread the budget um, as evenly as is possible, at least, uh, among the member states. 
And um, perhaps we have a bit more flexibility to do that, I would think, um, than if we would be in the straitjacket of the public procurement directive. At the same time, I, I should say, and Peter, there too, you've been involved in, in that kind of work um, because we have general conditions of contract, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, the, 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 let's say the relative freedom that the organization has must be used properly and, um, and fairly. And when we say fairly, that means also fairly in relation to the contractors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned the, um, the World Wide Web, of course, which uh, now I think is, is generally known, Tim Berners-Lee um, uh, started at CERN. Um, I, I heard a, a great interview recently with Professor Brian Cox, who is very well known uh, by TV viewers here. He's very much um, uh, the, 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 the easily understandable face of science on British television, but That's now works at CERN. Um, uh, uh, and I understood, uh, he, he was saying in, in this interview that when um, Tim Berners-Lee uh, developed his proposal for the World Wide Web at CERN um, and put it down on a paper to submit to his boss, which was headed World Wide Web, a data management system, uh, his boss, and I don't know who it was at the time. Um, uh, Mike, yeah, somebody called Mike Sandel. Yeah, ah, exactly. Max Handel, that was the name, um, wrote on it something along the lines of vague but potentially interesting, um, which I thought was, uh, uh, you know, uh, we've all had our school reports, which, um, uh, you know, perhaps um, uh, at the time don't recognize the potential that people might have. And that was clearly one. But the, the interesting thing for me, and, and, and which I thought it would be worth you just talking about for a moment or two in the context of the World Wide Web, but also other scientific developments at CERN, I mean, the, the public does not pay for the World Wide Web. Mm. If it had been developed at a, uh, an industrial um, organization, one imagines that um, it would uh, cost the public to use and uh, make the organization a fortune. Why is that? Why um, yeah. are we not having to pay for that uh, and, and, and other developments? That's a very good question. By the way, um, there, are, there are different stories, uh, I would almost say competing stories about exactly the origin and, and, and what exactly um, was the feedback to, uh, uh, you know, Mike, Mike wrote that. Uh, I'm not sure how far the paper that Mike wrote, in fact, made it further at that time with his colleagues, with et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but, what I th what I, but when I hear that, I always think what would have happened if... if um, you know, it would have been interesting if it didn't say vague but interesting. But what is it? Hap what happens if people say your boss says it's interesting but vague, which is a slightly less encouraging uh, note, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, um, I um, on the I think there's there's it's it's little known, but I think it, it deserves indeed some recognition. That, let's say the legal dimension of the web's history, because that's really what you're talking about. In, in 93, at the end of April, I think it was, CERN uh, management released a two-page memo, not even super well-crafted, I have to say, when you read it in hindsight, but it doesn't matter, it did, it did have its effect, where they placed, uh, in fact, the, the, the web's underlying software, three different components, I think, uh, basic client, uh, was called basic, serve, basic server, basic client, and the library of common code, I think it's all called. So the underlying software was placed in the public domain. And that document, in fact, uh, signed by the management, was <laughs> headed to whom it may concern, which, which I find quite interesting because uh, it kind of suggests that they didn't know who the target audience was. And in, in, hindsight, in hindsight, I think this line can equally be interpreted as, as an unintended address uh, to humanity as large, you could say, right? But so the legal implication of this was that CERN relinquished all IP in the software. And, um, and the intention, as stated in the memo, was that the release would, the hope was that this release would then further compatibility, common practices, it says, and standards in networking, computing, collaboration. And there again, I think these are kind of modest uh, ambitions for something that ultimately turned out to be a seismic technological step, right? Um, and we were talking about the, 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 we'll go back very, I'll, I'll just go back two minutes, I'll keep two minutes back to, to the 1950s. Um, because that is, I think, the seed for this ultimate decision that was taken in, in all the way in April 1993. And in the 50s, as you know, the term software was rather understood, I think, as clothing or something like that, but certainly not as what it is now. And so CERN, born out of the ashes of the Second World War, mentioned that, and no work from their requirements. And, and together with that, another requirement was that the, work should, that the results of the organization's work should not be secret, 
but should only be published or made generally available, it says, right? And so in the early years, this openness, I think, just manifested itself through publishing in scientific journals, pure paper publishing in scientific journals. But over time, this, this openness became the cultural norm. And, and, I, and I think you could say that, that the release of, the, the, of the, the web software into the public domain, I think on the one hand you can say is a consequence in itself, I think, of this requirement of openness. It inspired that, I think. And it's also a precursor to the tools that have been built forth on the web since then. So at CERN, that would be uh, the open access publishing model that CERN follows, uh, open source software, obviously very well known, open source hardware, CERN has hardware licenses, uh, and open data. And so all of that comes from that, um, com comes, let's say, uh, is st stimulated by that memo, but ultimately it came, you have to go all the way back to the convention, I think, to see the seed. Um, very interesting, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it, it is. And, and uh, uh, just uh, w one reason I think many of us um, have uh, the, um, the, the, are grateful, I think, to CERN for, uh, for what, it's, uh, what it's been able to produce. Um, the, um, you were talking earlier about the, the number of people um, who were at CERN and where they all come from. Um, just give us a, an idea of, of, of how many people can be at CERN at any one time. Uh, right. I know from my experience, it, it, it varies massively depending on whether the Large Hadron Collider is running or not, and, and, and therefore yeah. um, uh, activity is taking place. So uh, yeah. To, oh, yeah. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, Peter, I think it's good to, to, to explain, to introduce the issue by, by mentioning first that the, the original, there was originally, let's say, a split at CERN within the convention as well. CERN employees built the accelerator. Visiting scientists come to um, build experiments. In fact, originally it was seen that all of that would be done by CERN, but the scale became so large that collaborations had to be started with other institutes. And so what we have today is still in a very general sense, the split. We have people who construct accelerators and we have people who come and visit, who design, construct and operate, of course, the, uh, and now upgrade uh, the detectors huh? for these big experimental collaborations. And so our, um, our personnel makeup and people on the site reflect that. Um, we have um, an employed body by CERN and we have all of these folks that are visiting scientists and engineers that come and construct and also help us in the building of the accelerator. So I know I've looked at the statistics. I see here that last year, um, CERN personnel comprised about 2,700 staff, so that's employees. Uh, more than 700 fellows, let's say junior employees in a sense, uh, more than 500 students and 13,500 associated scientists. So these is this user community, let's say we call them. And they come from 100 nationalities, over 100 nationalities from uh, institutes, scientific institutes that are located in more than 70 countries around the world sometimes from surprisingly uh, far and ex exotic places, in fact. Um, so, yes, you mentioned that before CERN, European organization, I think we can say in name it is, but in terms of looking at the, our experts on the site, all of our people, it's a truly a global, uh, a global lab. Now, I mentioned as well procurement, Peter. Um, uh, we have a, a lot of people, uh, obviously, on, on the site as well that are working as uh, contractors, people who make cables, people who take care of electricity, all sorts of things, etc. And one example, so uh, one example, I think, is the one that you're very familiar with, is our civil engineering construction works. Um, and so right now, for instance, we have the works for the luminosity upgrade, and a lot of that is underground, which is where the LHC, uh, of course, is located. We have a sizable procurement team. You've, you know them, you've met some of these people that we work with a lot and then we work with you. And, um, and just to say maybe, maybe a bit of a boring statistics in, in our own legal service. So in our central legal service, we are, I think, uh, 13. And we have antennas, legal antennas, lawyers. Uh, there are lawyers in the office dealing with relations with the host states, France and Switzerland. Uh, knowledge transfer, working with industry, a lot of expertise in IP in particular. Then we have a lawyer who's dedicated to health and safety and environmental issues, which is certainly not a luxury, of, of course. And then we have lawyers in our human resources uh, department, and we, we work together. Yeah. You have a, a, it sounds like a very shifting population at, at, at CERN. Um, COVID um, must have had a huge impact on your ability to, to operate and manage, I'm assuming. 
Yes. Um, I, 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 I've been a witness to it in part because of my involvement in some of the work related to that. And in part, I talked to a few colleagues to ask them what their take on this is, what they've seen, etc. Um, of course, so yesterday, for instance, I was on the site. And of course, it's very visible as well that uh, even if we are ramping up numbers now, it is very visible that this is not a shadow for the time being of what it certainly normally is, which is this, as you know, this hive of activity and dynamic spirit. Um, so currently, CERN is in a long shutdown, it's called, for maintenance and upgrades of the LET, of the accelerator. So, in fact, we're not operating accelerators at the moment. Uh, but analysis of ex existing data has uh, basically continued unhindered, I understand. And, and a lot of CERN's work has been done, has continued to be done with work that people that, uh, that are working from home. Um, Nevertheless, the shutdown work has not surprisingly undergone delay and, and uh, the, the, the schedule for restarting accelerator facilities, of course, are being redrawn as we speak. Uh, during the lockdown, the decision was taken to only have people on the site that were essential for the safety of the site, including equipment. And that meant that we had about 300 people on the site still, but so therefore dropping down from a number of thousands and thousands, in fact, to, to about 300. Uh, in the meantime, which, which I think was very encouraging, um, there was a, a huge grassroots desire, and I think this, this typifies the mindset of the, of the physicist, really, and, and, and perhaps also the engineers that are connected to physics. Uh, there was a huge grassroots desire to contribute to fighting COVID. And, uh, and this led to the establishment of a task force called CERN against COVID-19, uh, of which I'm uh, one of the members, so I've been witnessing and involved in it, and I can speak about it with some enthusiasm, I think I can say. Uh, the, the, the group has overseen an enormous amount of activities that were brought to the task force um, from the, to the workforce, so to speak. Individuals who said, what if we do this, what if we do that, etc." Literally hundreds and hundreds of ideas came uh, by email into the group and, and by other means. And, um, and so some examples of that has been, for instance, the deployment of certain emergency services. We have ambulances, fire trucks, etc., in the region um, for, in fact, uh, transporting patients into hospitals, etc. cetera. Uh, CERN has, has produced a, a massive amount of sanitizer gel also for the, for, for the region. Uh, personal protective equipment, um, face shields and masks in particular, and, and uh, with which, especially in the beginning, the medical community in the region, both in France and in Switzerland, has been uh, assisted. Um, and then computing resources, very interesting. Uh, we've offered our computing resources. People came to ask for our computing resources that are involved in, com in, in, in data crunching and simulations, etc., with respect to the virus. Um, and, um, and then I think, the, the, I think I can say the highlight, I think, of the work of the, the people at CERN there was a team connected to our so-called LHCB experiment, which is one of the LHC experiments, and they developed a medical ventilator. Um, they did that in the space of a few weeks, going around the clock, basically, in, in the, not even in teams. I think they were all going around the clock, basically. And that ventilator uh, was completed, uh, as I mentioned, in a, in a, in a matter of weeks. It's quite a complex machine. Uh, interesting maybe to mention that the focus was on a certain um, simplicity, perhaps mechanical simplicity of the machine to have a certain robustness and on low cost in terms of, um, uh, of putting it, in fact, producing it. Um, it also has a feature which I believe makes it um, uh, perhaps more interesting for more challenging environments for deployment, which is that I believe that there is a system with battery backups um, making that it should be uh, uh, operable as well in environments with, with unreliable and unstable uh, energy supply. Um, so I believe that CERN is uh, the, 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 the team that is, uh, working on the, uh, has been working on the, uh, the ventilator together with our knowledge transfer colleagues are in dialogue now with different organizations uh, to try to take this further and perhaps use this as a standard for a, an affordable uh, ventilator. Um, the, the legal service itself, I mean, we have, like everybody else, like, like you, Peter, um, we went into, uh, when the site went into safe mode, um, something happened that surprised me, which is that our workload increased sharply, actually, um, from a, say, reasonably normal workload to um, 
something much more. And part of that, I think, was because COVID itself, you can understand with the facilities and all these people on the site, etc., uh, and with a large number of people as well, financially dependent on support from CERN, um, a lot of issues arose uh, to be tackled by the management. And of course, in the, in the, in the shadow of that, the, the, uh, the usual legal issues that come with that, had to be tackled in the first few weeks, especially. And, um, and, and, and so this, this meant, in fact, that the, that, that the workloads increased sharply in the beginning. And I think this applied to, for, for, I've heard that elsewhere as well. And a lot of colleagues, not just in the legal service, had a, a fairly tough time in the beginning and then it stabilized. Um, I, I personally found, um, found it um, a challenge in the sense that I was surprised that it is, I would say it's efficient, um, but at the same time, it, it, I must say, but I think it's very personal. For me, it cannot replace in-person um, work. Mm. Um, how are people doing? Walking to somebody's office and say, what do you think of this, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, make sure that your people are fine. Um, or, or for instance, reading the mood in the room, right? <laughs> what is the direction of the discussion? Uh, I miss that. That, 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 for, that doesn't work. Zoom I've, and, and, uh, and other tools... <laughs> are amazing, but they cannot convey it to me, I must say, you know, that, that's... Uh, um, so throughout the lockdown, the CERN Council has continued to meet at the regular intervals, also other member state bodies, um, with the management and the and, and legal service, um, and I believe the, uh, yes, and the, and the people who took minutes, etc. cetera. Um, I think uh, most of us were, most were, on site, whereas the delegates uh, tuned in from their cap respective capitals. But that has there has been continuity and a, and a lot of work there. Uh, now we are in the situation where we're going back up. Um, CERN hopes to, I, I believe that the current planning or the hope is that we would have a return to more or less normalcy in terms of the numbers by September. Um, but of course, it depends on the health situation in, in the surrounding countries and beyond. Um, I think one challenge is possibly that that whilst, of course, there is a level of control over our own staff, our own employees, all of these visiting scientists are not, are, are not necessarily subject to the authority of the organization and, and need to deal with their home institutes and the constraints in the countries where they are located. Huh? Think about immigration, et cetera, but also health issues in their institutes. And so in terms of the, um, the, the, the restart and, the, and, and also the upgrade work of the, ex work of the experiments, I believe that's probably more of a challenge. To get that, um, it's probably hard to have that listen to an exact timetable. I would say. Yes. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, think, I, I think, say, Yeah. So go ahead, Peter. I was going to say I think restarting whatever it is is an issue in most countries now in terms of what you can do and how far you can go. It must be exacerbated to an extent for you, given that on being on the Swiss-French border with with two different nations with um, different infection rates and and different controls and regulations and your staff coming from those two, um, how you're going to balance that out going forward? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly now, I would know the exact detail of how much freedom there is today between the two host states in terms of people crossing borders going to work. But I believe that that is something where we have full support from the host states to make that work. In other words, that the, the, border, should not, the border running through the site should not be a hinder for that. Those people that we needed to get on the site over the past few months, actually, that really needed to be there, have uh, by and large been able to do that, I understand, um, on the strength of the need simply to be back at CERN, regardless of the fact that there was a border in there. Um, and, um, well, what is, I should mention you, Peter, because the work that you do for us and with us often involves contractors. I should maybe just mention that... Um, the legal, something particularly legal maybe about this first. Uh, so I mentioned the site is, is in a sense, you could say two sites, but we operate it as a single site. It tries to be as functional as, as, as a single site in a sense. But the accelerator, of course, is much larger than the site. The accelerator is 27 kilometers and the site is shorter and accelerator branches out of that. Now, um, from a legal perspective, perhaps interesting to mention, Authority over the site is vested in the Director General by virtue of the Convention and the host state agreement with France and Switzerland. And so that also applies in health and safety questions. And so um, decisions taken by our Director General in those matters are decisions that apply 
to the activities on the site. The, the site is fenced in, we call it, <clears throat> and, and what is outside the fencing part, so let's say the works that are done for high luminosity at points on the accelerator that are outside, are therefore beyond the fencing part. What that means legally is that, that, when, uh, that for COVID measures, uh, for, for making, ensuring safety, etc., cetera, um, the, the, uh, most of the contractors obviously were under instructions by the, uh, the measures uh, uh, taken by the Director General for, any, for whoever was on the site would also apply to them. Whereas um, for some of the works that were done outside fence, that includes these particular work, working points for the uh, high luminosity upgrade, there they answer for health and safety um, to national law. The point that is located is Switzerland to Swiss law and in France to France. Um, how, however, of course, uh, uh, our Director General Fabiola Giannotti does not take her decisions in isolation from the situation in the two host states. And so I think you can say that in the measures that were devised and that she has taken as adopted, um, those have run in parallel to the developments in the two host states. And, um, and the same applies now in the decisions to, re to, to reopen CERN. That too is in parallel to what the host states in fact make possible. So I think we've, we've managed to avoid issues. Um, we could have had issues, but we've managed to avoid issues by looking carefully across the, the border, I think. And yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. You mentioned the high luminosity project and, and, and um, the, the fact that you are, as you refer to it, as an upgrade. Um, and I know that the civil engineering works um, are reasonably well progressed. Um, and the aim, uh, at least if I read the press, is to try and see if there's anything uh, smaller than Higgs boson. Um, well, the, the, perhaps you could explain um, just in a word or two, precisely what it is that, that CERN is looking to achieve with the high luminosity upgrade. Yes. I mean, I know um, you, you send the particles um, around in the beam at just under the speed of light. So I know you can't make them go any faster. So I'm just wondering uh, what it is that you're, you're hoping to be able to do that will uh, enable you to, uh, to, to increase the impact of the collisions. Yes. Uh, Peter, you're, you're taking me into dangerous territory because you know, God, God forbid that, that a physicist is going to listen uh, to this dialogue between us. And so, uh, I, yes, I have a vague idea about it, because I thought, but I thought that it was fair to check it with a physicist. And, and I think the first thing I should say is that you're entirely right about one aspect, which is the beam energy, so to speak, the speed. And so the, the two parameters, I understand, that basically determine the performance uh, of any accelerator is on the one end what is called the absolute beam energy. Basically, I believe that that would be the speed. And the other one is what is called luminosity. And uh, the luminosity is, I believe, defined as, um, the luminosity is an expression of, I should say it differently, you see already getting the difficulties here. It's a measure of the number of particle collisions that the accelerator can deliver. So you have a combination of the energy and the, out, and the quantity of collisions that can be generated with that energy. So the purpose of the luminosity upgrade is in fact to try to keep LHC um, relevant and make it more interesting over a significant period of time by precisely making it possible to get more collisions out of the, uh, out of the accelerator, out of the LHC. Um, so the energy will remain the same, but the, I think that the intent is or the plan or the hope is that the amount of data that in fact will be generated and analyzed will increase very significantly. And that's the purpose of the high luminosity upgrade now. In terms of analyzing data, as you mentioned earlier, um, and I know from our previous discussions, the, the, put very basically, and as you said earlier, you provide the machine, others come and carry out experiments, design experiments and carry them out. Um, and then can go away and um, spend months and years analyzing the data that it produces. So in some respects, um, access physically to the site is, is not a requirement for, for many of them from the point of view of data analysis. Um, just looking forward in a post-COVID world, um, uh, do you think that that is going to impact the way in which the, the, the accelerator is used by scientists or, or will it go back to where it was? I have to say, Peter, on this one, I find it difficult to give an answer um, specifically about CERN. I, I think that I don't feel qualified enough, but I feel 
qualified perhaps to make one comment that I've heard everywhere, and perhaps as well, you know, when you speak about COVID, um, I have not met anyone who doesn't say, in fact, that um, that it has uh, that COVID has put a new focus on the way we work, and that we have to rethink how we work. And I'm not, and I. I would be surprised if that is a reflection that would be specific to CERN with very unique results for CERN, how we'll go further. I believe that it's a general reflection that we will make. There's also environmental aspects, obviously. We've all seen the photos of Beijing with and without smog, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that CERN will certainly try um, to learn lessons of how we can operate more efficiently. But I would be speculating if I would say how that will be filled in at CERN. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, the, the, the physicist, it, it's interesting because the, it, it's not just that physicists come and go, depending, and come and go, and then they go back to teach at the Home Institute, for instance, again for a while, and then come at CERN and do experiments. Uh, it's also interesting that, it, that um, the way I understand it is that each phase of the work surrounding, an, let's, say, an develop, let's say, the development of an accelerator, but also of detectors, needs a different type of specialization of physicists. So one would have an applied physicist, in fact, that one has a theorist, let's say, that first says, I, I think there's maybe this, can we examine that please? At that point, an applied physicist, I believe comes in to say, this is the kind of machine that we need and the machine is built, but the actual exploitation of the accelerator on the detectors is then done by experimentalists. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just that the same person comes back and forth, you know, a couple of times a year or for longer periods of time. I believe that the profile perhaps the background you know, of these physicists and engineers possibly might also vary in accordance with the phase of the, uh, of the construction that's being done, the experimental program. Yeah, no, that all makes sense, that all makes sense. Perhaps uh, just a minute or two on, on the Science Gateway project. Yes, yes. That is a, a project that gives a lot of um, uh, hope precisely for exciting program to offer to, uh, to our visitors. Um, uh, a few years ago, um, Fabiola RDG, I think, came with this uh, came with this idea in dialogue with various people who were supportive of that, who would be supportive of that venture, uh, to have, in fact, a, a science center. I'm not sure, I wouldn't call it a museum, perhaps, right? A science center that would uh, basically show the certain experiments um, and um, in a way that that could not be offered. In fact, even if you could go into the tunnel, that could possibly not be offered in the tunnel itself. So she came with this, this idea of science gateway that started developing. Um, and um, also interesting is that uh, not so long after that, um, she met uh, uh, Renzo Piano, the architect. In fact, I believe that he might have visited Stern. And Renzo, was, uh, uh, Renzo Piano was very excited uh, about uh, CERN, and, and I believe that he suggested that, that he would be you know, quite interested to, to help us with a vision for such a science center. And so um, that will indeed be born. Um, there's been very significant fundraising has been done, very generous donors. Uh, all in all, the budget will be uh, about, I think, 75 million. The invitation to tender has gone out for the construction works. And then if they should turn has gone out for something that is almost equally important, which is the content, the museology, basically part of it. And those two are in parallel now. So we're now in fact waiting for bids to come in on all of that. And I'm quite convinced that shortly after that, we'll have a phone call with you um, to discuss a, a few issues that will roll out of that. Um, it will be, a, I think, a fascinating um, a project. Nice thing to mention, perhaps, it, in fact, what's gonna happen is that right adjacent to the CERN site, there will be essentially a forest planted and the science gateway will be rising from that on, on pillars, let's say. Um, and the, the, the structure of the building in fact is inspired and will look in fact like the, like the like accelerate, like tubes. It's inspired in fact, I would say by LHC probably. It's two circular tubes, I think, run in parallel to each other with uh, tubes on the side branching out. Um, I don't know what now the date is for completion, um, but I think that, with that, that, that within two or three years, we might sign the gate, but hopefully we might see, uh, see the light. Perhaps I'm too optimistic, but a very exciting project indeed. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, hopefully in two or three years time, we are back to normal and uh, CERN will be inundated uh, with visitors and, uh, who will learn an awful lot. But I, I've got to say, 
thank you very much indeed for today. I've learned a, a lot and, and I've been working with you for, for many years and I thought I knew um, a fair bit about it, but that's certainly expanded my knowledge and I hope um, those who listen to this uh, will find it equally interesting. And it's Peter, great, it's great to talk to you, Martin. Thank you very yeah, much. It's, it's a privilege and, and, and I want to say, Peter, and, and uh, people should know that, I think that, you know, you're a busy man and, and you have all these, these arbitrations, etc. But but you're also you're a science uh, you're a science guy you're a science buff and a bit of an engineering guy as well, and and we've always been privileged to to feel that CERN uh, has always um, uh, that you've always had a spot in your agenda still even at unexpected difficult moments for CERN, and um, I'm hoping we can keep you to that for the, for a few years still. Well, that's very kind, Martin, and as you know, I'm always delighted to help. So um, uh, it's 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 an honour for me to be involved with it, but. Uh, uh, thank you once again. No, that's great. Thank you. Privilege.